Prime and Peter Chambers. Created by Henry Kane, transcribed and starring Dane Clark. Private investigator, duly licensed and duly sworn, Peter Chambers. You're a private eye. That's your business. Anything else? That's for laughs. It's strictly business this trip. You've been paid a little fee by a little lady in a little apartment on Gramercy Park. And now she's wringing her hands, and she's got plenty to wring her hands about. Her name is Mrs. Donald Sloan, and only yesterday her husband was declared an embezzler. Seems he worked in a bank, only he must have thought it was a garden patch. Because yesterday, before he disappeared, he helped himself to 100,000 shreds of lettuce. All crisp and all green. Mr. Chambers, my husband wasn't a thief. You got a better name for a man who elopes with 100,000 bucks? Not Donald. I tell you, there's something wrong here, something peculiar. Mrs. Sloan, listen. Look, here's the morning paper. Let me read it to you. But... Now, the headline. Bank teller and $100,000 vanish at lunch. I... No, 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 no. Beneath that, the following. Donald Sloan, teller and junior officer of the Trade Bank of the City of New York, is being sought by the police, charged with the embezzlement of $100,000 of bank funds. <laughs> Mr. Sloan, an employee of long standing, left his teller's cage as usual at the lunchtime. When he failed to return, a hasty check by Charles Jenkins, manager of the bank, revealed that Sloan's cash was $100,000 short. But... Curiously... Mr. Sloan had passed up an additional 28000 in the same draw. Look, However, Mr. Chambers, to the police, I'm just another wife doing the usual screaming about the innocence of her husband. Look, there is no denying the guy walked out of that bank with 100000 clams. But he left 28000 Yes, but... Why? If you're going to steal, why not all? Mrs. Sloan, I'm a detective, not a clairvoyant. But... <laughs> okay, okay. Just what do you want me to do for you? Look, Mr. Chambers, I'm not trying to whistle my way past a graveyard. I have no illusions about my husband. What? But I know for certain the man was not a thief. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Illusions? How did you and your husband get along? Not too well of late. Well, how so, and since when? Since about two months ago. Uh, a lady? You might call her that. What's her name? I don't know. I tried to ignore it, but last week we quarreled, my husband and I... And he asked that we separate. I heard him on the phone several times talking to a... Frankie. Well, Frankie could be a man. No, no, he has no man friend by the name of Frank. Do you think there's any connection between the request for a separation and the embezzlement? No, because I don't think he was involved in the embezzlement. Oh, here we go again. All right, all right then, Mrs. Sloan. Your husband worked at the 34th Street branch, didn't he? Yes. Fine. I'll be in touch with you as soon as anything develops. Uh, one other thing. Do you have a picture of your husband? Yes, yes, I do. Oh, it's an excellent photo. I'll get it for you. So, off you go, and it's tic-tac-toe. You haven't the faintest idea where to make the first stab. You check down at headquarters with your friend, Detective Lieutenant Louis Parker, and all he's got so far is a great big bunch of nothing. He calls the bank for you, gives you a nice write-up, and that's your next stop. Please sit down, Mr. Chambers. I know that you represent Mrs. Sloan. I'll do my best to cooperate. Charles Jenkins, bank manager. A skinny little guy, egghead type. Large, bald dome, heavy glasses, and a mouth that's all teeth. Uh, this is a privately owned bank, Mr. Chambers. Uh, all of our employees have been with us for many years and completely to be trusted. <clears throat> or so we thought. The uh, newspaper has said something about Sloan's having been a, uh, uh, a junior officer, I think that was the term. Yes, yes, very true. Uh, Part-time he was at the teller's window and part-time he handled business transactions for us, mostly real estate. I see. Now, what about that $28,000 he left in his drawer? What about it, Mr. Chapman? Now, look, grand larceny is grand larceny. Why take the 100 and leave the 28? If you're stealing, why not take it all? The penalty's the same. Mm, I'll admit you have a point there, sir. Uh, it sort of puts me over on his side a little bit. Sort of uh, spurs my investigation. Uh, sincerely, Mr. Chambers, I hope and trust you're right. It would, uh, well, 
how shall I say it, uh, restore my faith in human nature. After all, he was a married man. Well, well, don't get restored all at once, Mr. Jenkins. Our boy was having a little trouble at home. Trouble? A tomato. Tomato, Mr. Chambers? Uh, a lady. It seems it started a couple of months ago. His wife tells me he met the lady here at the bank. Uh, suppose I take a gander at the books. Gander, Mr. Chambers? Oh, dear. Suppose I look over his books. You know, recent new accounts, business matters, that kind of stuff. But the police have already done that, sir. Uh, not from my angle, Mr. Jenkins. Me, I'm looking for a dame. Uh, yes, yes, Mr. Chambers. Yes, indeed, indeed. Uh, if you'll come this way, sir, I'll put you into his teller's cage and surround you with everything pertaining to his affairs. Hmm, dame, dame, indeed. <laughs> You spend a couple of hours bent over books like a bank examiner. You go over the whole works, and you come up with one lousy little item that you jot down on a sheet of paper. You're hoping against hope, and then Jenkins joins you. How goes it, Mr. Chambers? Well, one tiny little lead. Yes? Within the last three months, this new account here, a Miss Frances Lake, Opened her account about two months ago, which jibes with the time element Mrs. Sloan mentioned. Also jibes with the name Mrs. Sloan gave me. The name? Uh, what name, sir? Well, a lady in his life, Frankie. That's all Mrs. Sloan knew, just one name, Frankie. And you think this Francis Lake might be that Frankie? It's a frequent enough nickname. Well, it's the only possible thing I can come up with in all this pile of stuff here. I wrote it down, see? Francis Lake, 1252 East 47th Street. From which she removed about three weeks ago. Well, how do you know? From the police. Did she leave a forwarding address? Unfortunately, she did not. But it was strictly routine, Mr. Chambers. There was no special interest in her then, and there is none now. The big, brilliant detective and his one lousy little clue. You crumple the sheet of paper and you pitch it to the wastebasket and you throw a strike. But it pops out of the basket because the basket's brimful of junk. You cast an accusing glare at the fastidious Mr. Jenkins. Is something, Mr. Chambers? Say, what's with this bank anyway? Don't people have a cleanup around here? <laughs> Matter of fact, the baskets in this cage haven't been emptied since yesterday. What's the matter? Can't the bank afford it? Well, we employ one cleaning lady who, working through the night, does an excellent and thorough job. So? <laughs> Our lady came down with, <laughs> of all things, measles. And we were informed today to secure a substitute. So when the men came in this morning, each one of them cleaned and emptied their own waste baskets. Uh, since Mr. Sloan's cage was unoccupied today, his baskets are still full. Did you tell this to the police? Police? That our charwoman came down with the measles? Well, don't be ridiculous, Mr. Chairman. Ridiculous, huh? These waste baskets are still full of Sloan's stuff, yesterday's stuff, before he walked out for that famous lunch hour. You make a dive for those trash baskets like there's gold in them, our hills of refuse. And gold there is. Because you come up with a sheet off a desk pad diary. Yesterday's date, and on it is written, Frankie, 1215, real estate, Stanley Building. What is it, Mr. Chambers? What is it? Your faith in human nature. Well, what are you talking about? It still holds good, Mr. Jenkins. Donald Sloan is not an embezzler. Here, read this. Huh? Frankie? 1215, real estate, Stanley Building. 1215, lunchtime yesterday. This guy was no embezzler, Mr. Jenkins. Embezzlers don't tip their mitts like that. Tip their mitts, Mr. Chambers? Mr. Chambers! You're off and running. Destination Stanley Building. Which turns out to be a dilapidated, flea-bitten crumb hole decked out to be an office building. It's down near the battery, wedged in between a couple of warehouses. There are a few like it in every town, fitted out for fly-by-night operators. It's four stories high. And a peek at the billboard downstairs informs you that F. Lake Real Estate is on the second floor, room 201. There is no elevator, so you creak up the wooden steps, but when you face up to the solid oak of 201, it's locked. And nobody answers your knock. Downstairs, you flash your credentials at a seedy-looking janitor, give off with some important detective routine palaver. But a uh, $20 bill is the final convincer. He gives you a key, tells you to say you stole it in case of emergency, and back you go to 201. You turn the key in the lock. And you open the door. 
Come in, Buster, and close the door behind you. You don't close the door just because he told you to. His order carried additional authority in the form of a chunky revolver held in a pudgy fist. The guy seated behind the desk is fatter than a bookmaker's bankroll. He's really huge, decked out in a white Palm Beach suit with a floppy Panama hat square on his head. He's big, thick, red-faced, with tiny gleaming pig eyes set within many folds of fat. Like this little man, you're liable to get killed. Uh, like what? Like barging in where you ain't invited. Uh, who invited you? You're not F. Lake. I ain't. So, who are you? <laughs> There's a hot one. A boy breezes in where he don't belong, and right away he starts pecking with the stupid questions. Sit down, chump. Over there. Okay, I'm sitting. And I'm standing up. <clears throat> oh, you're a large one. Little pal, I don't know who you are, but sticking your nose in where it don't belong, it picks up trouble. I got a large hunch you're gonna be awful sorry you came here, little pal. Yeah, I'll tell you a little secret. I'm sorry I came here. I'm sorry I ever came here. Now I'm gonna blow. Now first I take your key, like so. And then me, I blow. And I'm gonna lock you in. Then you're here, and I ain't. Goodbye, little pal. And take it from me. You ain't gonna be lonesome. For a few seconds, you sit there like you're rooted to the chair. Who wouldn't? Then you bounce up and start moving. And then behind the desk, you find him. Donald Sloan sprawled on the floor, dead. A knife stuck in his back. You reach for the phone, but the phone's as dead as Donald. So you're back to being a detective. You frisk the dead Donald, and you come up with the usual items. But you're working at your trade, and some of the usual items are unusual. For instance, he's a smoker, cigarettes in his pocket, and seven packs of matches. But four of them bear the same ad, Cafe Prince. Cafe Prince. You check it in the phone book, and it's down on Sullivan Street. The next problem is getting out of there. The door's too tough. But it develops that your fat friend isn't too bright. The windows are sealed, but glass is breakable. And there's a fire escape right handy. So you're moving again. But you stop off at your office for your gun, and then it's the Cafe Prince. A sign on the door says closed, moving out. But when you try the door, it's open. What's on your mind, bub? The question comes from a redhead at the check room. She's black-eyed and pretty, with a cuter assortment of curves than a World Series pitcher. You stick your head around the bend, the joint's deserted, a saloon with most of the chairs on the table. But the liquor bottles are still showing behind the bar. Joint's closed, mister. We're moving out tonight. Uh, well, can I check my hat? Because it was you, I'd love to check my hat. Well, look, Mac, if you got a thing for check girls, go somewhere else. Lots of check girls in this town. Oh, uh, I got it for you, cutie. Blow, will got... you? Well... Can I have some food? How's about some food? Can I get a Kitchen's sandwich? Kitchen's closed. Oh, I, 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 I saw the bar is still open. That's all I want, honey. I need a drink. That's all. Oh, arguing with a rum pot adds up to a rumpus and a rumpus we don't need around here. Oh, come here. on, honey. I need a drink. I need a bath. Okay, Where okay. Go on in. Have your drink. Have two drinks. Tell the bartender the chick girl said you could have them for free. And then get out of here. You understand? <laughs> You weave around the bend into the deserted room, and there's no one behind the bar. So you go into the usual drunk's routine. You slam your hand down. How's the bottle of service around here, huh? A curtain moves at the far end of the bar, and a man comes into view. And what do you know? It's your fat friend from the Stanley building. He's wearing an apron now. And on this trip, you've got to jump on him. Now, look, Mac, what the heck is going on? You see the pretty little gun in my hand, fat boy? 
Yeah, I see it. So be a nice little fat boy and come out from behind that bar. Sit down here at the table and let's you and I have a chat. Yeah. That's a nice little fat boy. Sit down. Yeah. What do you want? The story on how come you're locked in a room with a cadaver, which turns out to be Donald Sloan, who lifted 100,000 samples out of a little old bank called The Trade. Who? Who are you? As far as you're concerned, I'm the law cop. Private cop. I didn't do it. What's your name? George Sachs. Oh, George all the way, huh? Okay, let's have your story. It might do you a little good with the DA. Little pal, if private law is sitting here right opposite me... Public law don't figure to be far behind. That's smart enough for a stupid guy. Now, if I spill, you figure I can make a deal with the DA? It's happened before. Will you help, little pal? I'll do what I can. Okay. It was the dame. Francis Lake? Well, how'd you know? Ah, you haven't been reading the quarter books lately, pal. Every private eye's a genius. Come on, talk it up, Porky. Okay. Now... She happens to open an account in that bank. And that Sloan guy, he goes for her like a ton of bricks. She figures a guy works in a bank, a junior office guy, it's an opening, so she punches. <laughs> a cutie, that one. Real cutie. Keep talking. She don't go to rob the bank. She makes the bank come to her. Like how? Well, she opens the phony little real estate office. She tells him about a deal she's got to buy a piece of property worth three quarters of a million dollars. She tells him she needs 100,000 bucks for an option, that she can turn a profit within five days. How could she figure we could keep 100 Gs out of the bank for five days? I told you, she's a cutie. She sold it to him good, but good. Like how? Me, I'm supposed to own this hunk of property, an ex-bootlegger with plenty of old moolah. Property's supposed to be worth three quarters of a million. Okay, you're the bootlegger with the property. He brings it 100,000 bananas. It's supposed to be her money. Then the two of them, yesterday at 12.30, are supposed to wait for me. Why is he waiting? Part of a shoot apple deal. Now listen. I'm supposed to arrive. She hands me the option money. The papers are all drawn. Then I turn the money over to him so his bank can hold it in escrow. For what? Either she buys the property within five days or she's supposed to lose the option money. Oh, he figured the money goes back to the bank so he's protected, huh? Yeah. Now, this is how it's supposed to work out. I give him the 100 Gs. He's an officer at the bank. Him and I sign a paper. He picks up the dough and brings it back to the bank. Supposed to be holding it on the deal. Oh, the old round robber. That's right. He's going to cover up for her with the bank records. Like that, according to her, nobody gets hurt. The money's back in the bank. She's got a tight option on the property. She tells him she's already got a sucker who's going to buy the property within five days. Yeah. Then within the five days... She's supposed to sell the property at a neat commission. She's used the bank's money for the option, but the bank's still got the dough, and nobody's hurt. Smart dame. So how come the guy winds up dead? That's my beef. I don't mind taking money from a bank. That's like taking a jelly bean from a candy factory. But murder? Brother, that ain't my department. Never mind the philosophy, fat stuff. Just keep talking. Well, yesterday I wasn't even there. What do you mean you weren't even there? Well, Sloan thought I was supposed to be there, you understand? The plan was that it was her job to clip him over the noggin, tie him up, and then beat it with the 100,000 bananas. Oh. Instead, she sticks the seven to him. Why? So she can't ever put the finger on her. Now, I don't know nothing about that. I was here today. I read it in the papers how, how he disappears. And I ask her. And then she breaks it to me. That's why I was there when you barged in. Just what were you doing there? Figuring the angles, how to get the body out of there, maybe folding him in a trunk, something. Yeah, but you're it? the guy that don't want no truck with murder. It was done, wasn't it? Might have wound up like him if I didn't listen to her. But I'm talking now, ain't I? I've had it, little pal. A private eye in a deal like this. He can help a guy like me. You're about up to the jackpot question as to where the dough is when you feel the cold muzzle at the nape of your neck. You feel that gun at your neck, mister? I feel it. Okay, now give your Roscoe to fat stuff. 
Okay. He's got it. No. Just before your brains get blown out, I bet you're dying to know where that dough is, huh? Dying is correct, m'lady. In a suitcase in the trunk compartment of my car right outside. <laughs> so near and yet so far. You'd be Frankie Lake, wouldn't you? Yeah. And if I could turn around, you'd also be the hat check girl. Correct. Only it also happens that I own this joint, which is a white elephant if there ever was one. And now, Mr. Nosybody, a fond farewell to you. But it was fat stuff who pulled the trigger. And down she goes and you come up out of your seat and you're bent over her doing the inspection bit. It was the only way, the only way. I swear I never used the heater in my life, never. It ain't in me. I ain't no killer. But it was the only easy, way, Mac. Easy, I... does it, fat boy. No harm done. More's a pity. Scratch, flesh wound, period. They'll patch her up nice and pretty and they'll make her nice and healthy. And then she'll stand trial and she'll wind up in the hot seat after all. Ah, that's the way it goes, fat boy. A merry-go-round. That's life. And death. And there you've had crime and Peter Chambers. Dane Clark was starred as Peter Chambers. Crime and Peter Chambers transcribed was created and written by Henry Kane. Others in the cast were Mary Patton, heard as Mrs. Sloan, and Joe DeSantis as Jenkins. It was directed by Fred Way. This is Fred Collins inviting you to tune in next week, same time, same station, for Dane Clark in Crime and Peter Chambers. Some days are blue days. Some days are happy days. Some days are just ordinary days that you don't even notice go by. But here's a word about a day you can't miss. It's Tuesday. Any Tuesday on the NBC radio network this fall. We're calling it the biggest Tuesday night in radio. That's a big statement. But it's a big night. Listen, Lux Radio Theater moves to NBC in the fall. And you'll hear it every Tuesday. Yes, Lux Radio Theater on NBC. Your favorite stars... Your favorite stories on this station. Lux Radio Theater is enough to make any night a big radio night. But that's not all we mean because your lineup also includes Dragnet, People Are Funny, Fibber McGee and Molly, and The Great Gildersleeve. You can see what we mean by the biggest Tuesday night in radio. It's so big we couldn't wait to tell you about it.